Well, good morning, everyone. I give you about five out of ten. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. That's much better. You get 11 out of 10 that time. How about that? I think that's the best you've ever got. But welcome to St. Mary's Church, Eaton Soaking. If you're here in the church building, it's great that you can join us. If you're joining us online, a special welcome. If you're watching it live, if you're catching up later, you're very welcome. It's great that you can join us. Please do say where you're watching from so that we can respond later. But it's great that you can join us on this day. Well, we're going to begin our time together with some sung worship, singing two great uh, songs, because we're called in Scripture to praise God for who he is, despite the challenges of the world and everything we see around, which, of course, we are going to be reflecting on during the intercessions today on all that's going on in Ukraine. Who could but not? We're called to pray for the countries of the world and the leaders of the world. We need to make sure that we still focus on who God is and what he has done for us. And so our opening bracket of songs, Sing to the Lord, and He is Exalted, remind us just who God is, the fact that nothing catches God unawares. He holds everything in his hands. Amen. It, it's a lovely day too, Jane. You're so right. If able, would you please stand, everyone? Yes, Father, 
that you are exalted. You are the king who reigns on high. We thank you that you are in control, even when humanity appears to spin out of control. We thank you that we can look to you. We thank you that we can trust you with our futures, both in this world and for all eternity. So loving God, as we continue to sing your praises, as we continue to acknowledge who you are and all that you've done for us, Lord, continue, we pray, your good work in all our lives, and especially our young children, Lord, those of primary school age, Lord, and younger. Lord, as they go out to their classes now, Lord, we pray, bless them, teach them more about you, that they would grow up knowing, loving, and serving you, the God of love. In your name we pray. Amen. And so as the younger people go out, the youth stay in because they stay in for a little bit longer. We continue in our sung worship as we sing three more songs that remind us of who God is. Thank you.
to whom we can place our trust to lead us forward with each passing day. So, Lord, as we continue now in our time together worshipping you, Lord, Lord, come continue your work in all our lives that we would truly know your leading, your very living presence in our lives in everything we do. In your name we pray. Amen. And so as we continue in a prayer, as Barbara comes to lead us this morning, would you please... Be seated. And at this stage, the youth will leave us for their groups. Have a great time, youth. As you can see, we will be praying for the crisis in Ukraine this morning. Uh, please join with me in the words of Yellow. Father God, King of all nations, we cry out to you now for the people of Ukraine. We ask you to rescue those who are vulnerable from the hands of their enemies, that they may live without fear before you or their day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of Lords and Prince of Peace, our politicians are predicting the biggest war in Europe since 1945, and we simply cry out to you urgently to write another story in our time. Thwart the schemes of evil men, give wisdom beyond human wisdom, to peacemakers seeking an equitable and peaceful way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, Holy Spirit, we pray for the church in Ukraine, a nation which, in which 70% of the population call themselves Christian. Give our many brothers and sisters in that nation courage in this crisis, that they may proclaim the good news of your kingdom Bind up broken hearts and bring comfort to all who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. And the next prayer um, is from the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I would invite you to join in that with me. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons we pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them we pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Thank you, Barbara, for leading those prayers this morning. And a reminder, please do keep praying for Ukraine this day and every day. But join in the words of the Church's special prayer for today. We pray together saying... Holy God, you know the disorder of our sinful lives. Set straight our crooked hearts and bend our wills to love your goodness and your glory. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so our Bible reading is now going to be brought to us by Carol. Thank you, Carol. Our Bible reading this morning is um, come, come from the uh, book of Nehemiah, we're reading chapter 5. 
Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, <laughs> but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and fishermen. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I do apologise for that. When I heard our outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials, and I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending these people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the interest you're charging them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine and olive oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. Moreover, from the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his thirty-second year, twelve years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor, but the early governors those preceding me placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor, because the demands were heavy on these people. 
Remember me with favour, my God, for all I have done for these people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carol, for that reading. And never apologise for when a frog gets caught in your throat. I think we all know what it's like when you're saying something and all of a sudden you've got no voice. There's no worry about that. Thank you to those who came to the, uh, Carol's rescue. Can I just say a point? It may be useful at times to have a jug of water or glasses here at the front. That's something I don't normally do, but it could catch anyone out at any time. So, But thank you for that reading, Carol. Thank you. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for the words we've just heard read. Help us now to understand their truth, a truth that can enliven and enrich all our lives if we choose to let it. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, today we come to the final uh, session in our short chapter, uh, short series, looking at uh, the first five chapters of Nehemiah. At some stage, we will be looking at the other chapters, but today, the short series that we've been focusing on finishes today. And of course, the topic, the focus, is knowing how to deal with internal issues. Knowing how to deal with internal issues. Now, as God's people, everything's fine, never any problems, everything's hunky-dory 100% of the time, correct? No, good, it's not. Because actually, just as in our earthly families, we encounter challenging circumstances, so too, in God's family, we also encounter issues at different times that need resolving. But reflect for a moment on your earthly families. What are the dynamics like in your family? Don't volunteer anything. That's very personal, I know. Question, do you all get on? How do you celebrate together? How do you work through differences of opinion? And in a lot of families, there will be differences of opinion. That's only a normal. The question is, are you able to work through your differences? Sometimes in life, you can do all you can to resolve things, and it can never be resolved. The other people don't want that. The question is, have you done all you can to leave the door open? There is a challenge there. The reality is that every family, I believe, faces internal issues, including the church, which, of course, is God's family. Look around you. God's family is made up of all you guys. How do you feel about that? We're all unique, unrepeatable miracles indeed, Jane. And can I say, I haven't said that in well over a month, so no grumbling from people who might think I say it too often. But it's very true, yes, indeed. Our reading, though, today reminds us and reveals some of the internal issues Nehemiah faced within the Jewish community that threatened to derail the rebuilding of the walls. Now let's remember that the book of Ezra focuses on the rebuilding of the temple, as we've already discovered, and the rebuilding of collective worship. Nehemiah focuses on the rebuilding of the walls. And it didn't go, it wasn't straightforward. There were issues at times. And there were things that threatened to derail that work. And so this passage reveals to us some of the issues that Nehemiah faced, not from Arta, you know, from people outside, which we've already learnt about in earlier sermons as part of the series, but these are issues from within their own people, in a sense, within the church, if you think of it as today. The passage also reveals to us how Nehemiah responded. So today, we're going to firstly identify the issues, secondly, we're going to consider how Nehemiah responded, and then we'll consider what we learn from that for today. Are you ready for this journey, friends? Well, what were the issues in, uh, in Nehemiah's time in you know, Jerusalem? What were the issues? Well, first, in verses 2 to 5 of our reading today, that begins on page 487 to 488, the first of the issues was the lack of food, the lack of sharing the food available. As we read in verse 2, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. How many of you agree that we need food to survive? 
How many of you do well fasting? I have to put my hands down. I need to watch that my blood sugar level doesn't fall too low. Otherwise, what happens to me, darling? It's unpleasant. That's a very kind word. Thank you, darling. I'm sure you could use other words to describe it. Especially as this live stream, if my parents are watching, you'll probably know that only too well. But the fact is, we need food to stay alive. And the first issue is that there was a lack of the sharing of food. It was all being hoarded in one sense, what was available by a few and it was really difficult. This lack of food was also compounded as verse 3 tells us that there was a famine. There was a famine. And we know what a famine means. It means when food is scarce. If they'd had supermarkets like we did, the shelves would be stripped bare. They would be empty. So that also compounded. So that's the first issue, the lack of food or the sharing of food that was available. The second issue was a lack of money, a lack of money. As we read in verses 3 and 4, others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Friends, here we find taxation and a lack of personal income due to their circumstances had given rise to a lack of money. Because, of course, without money... The people, in that sense, couldn't survive. So there was a lack of money we see here. That's the second issue. The third issue concerns what I hope none of us here ever engage in. We might joke about it at times, and that's all right perhaps as a joke when we talk about slaves, but actually, hopefully, we don't engage in the buying and selling of people. This is the third issue. In other words, what we call slavery. As we read in verse 5 of our reading this morning, although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others and not to us. So friends, the third issue, slavery. Within the Jewish people, we're not talking about Jewish people being sold into slavery to the Gentiles, to the surrounding nations. We're talking about people selling their, you know, own, you know, family to other fellow Jews. It's despicable. It really is. It's not on. How would you like if you were to imagine that as you stood on the door, I started selecting out some of you as you left today and said, sorry guys, you're not going back to your family. I'm selling you into slavery. We need to repair the roof or whatever. We need to you know, fit new lights. We're going to sell you into slavery and raise our money like that. How would you feel? What would you say to me? Sorry? Get lost, my wife says. But imagine you're in a situation where you are powerless and you have no control over that. Friends, that kind of slavery exists today. And it exists, sadly, in this country. Do not shut your eyes to the absence saying it's only another problem elsewhere. Friends, this is a very real problem, especially when people are trafficked for whatever reason into this country as slaves to work in restaurants, kitchens, the sex trade, all sorts of things. People, you know, have nowhere to go. They are actually forced. This here is, in a sense, a theme, an issue we see that Nehemiah, you know, has to deal with. But, of course, what we've got to recognise first is that these issues have been going on without Nehemiah's knowledge. Nehemiah did not know that food was not being shared around. He did not know that there was a severe monetary issue. He did not know that there was slavery within his own people. You see, he had been appointed as governor, and of course, you know, of the land. And of course, operating a senior uh, position, you'll be surrounded by different advisors. And it's easy at times to actually uh, not share actually all the issues that are going on. And so for a time, Nehemiah did not know what was going on. And we discover that, you know, in this passage. And yet, as soon as he hears about it, we're told how he responds. How did he respond? In verse 6, Nehemiah says, When I heard their outcry and these charges referring to all that the people were bringing, I was very angry. 
How do you express yourself when you get very angry? Do you go silent and give people the silent treatment? Do you behave like a, a Veruca Salt or, you know, from Charlie and the Chocolate Fantry? It's not fair! How do you behave? I sometimes think we need to dramatise some of our Bible readings more to get that point across. Because, ah, yeah, no, I'm still there, sorry, yes. Um, because, actually, we see Nehemiah getting very angry. He was very angry, and his anger is immediate. He is furious that some Jews could treat their fellow Jews, their fellow kind, their kin, in such unbecoming ways, denying them a share of the food resources, especially at a time of famine, contributing to the financial hardship and even ruin of some, and even worse, turning some of his, their brothers and sisters into slaves. He really is incensed by it. He is cross. He is angry. You see, one thing we need to realize as part of the situation is that the work of rebuilding the walls was taking some Jews away from the work in their fields, which meant that in addition to the famine, they, their crops you know, couldn't get the usual attention that they would have needed. Not all Jews, as we've already discovered in this passage, were choosing to help with the rebuilding of the walls. There were some that were actually saying back and saying, no, I'm not going, not going to have anything to do with this. And they were no doubt many of the ones who were trying to financially benefit from the misery and the situation of their fellow Jews. So here is actually what Nehemiah is angry about. Jews who should have known better were taking advantage of the situation. Have you ever taken advantage of a situation when perhaps you know you shouldn't have? Well, here in the situation, we see Nehemiah, as we've been told, getting angry. Now, I need to highlight that it is not wrong to feel anger in response to a situation. You know, when we look at situations in the world, when we see things on the news, it is right to feel anger towards it to feel anger towards the situation in Ukraine, thinking, where is this going to end? Is Ukraine the first of the various countries around there that is going to fall over time? What is going to happen? You know, it is right to feel anger. The question is, though, is how we direct that anger. We're reminded also in the life of Jesus that Jesus was angry with different circumstances. For example, in Mark 3, when Jesus heals the man with a shriveled hand in the synagogue, Jesus, we're told, looked around at the Pharisees in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. You would think in that case that people would celebrate the healing, but instead the Pharisees left, finding a way to kill Jesus. Anger is all right if it's channeled correctly. Again, we know that later on when uh, people were bringing little children to Jesus and his disciples got in the way, his disciples said, children should be out of the way. They shouldn't be seen or heard. Jesus, we're told, was indignant. He got angry and he said, no, let them come to me. I'll be reflecting on that later on today in one of the baptism, ser uh, baptism service I'm doing this afternoon here. So anger is not right or wrong, but how we respond to such situations does matter. And Nehemiah's response reveals to us three key principles we need to learn as to how we should always respond to situations that make us angry. And for this time, I want you to equate anything that gets you going, anything which you feel a sense of injustice about, something that you says, that is not right, that needs to change. Any situation like that is what I'm talking about, that which makes us angry. So how should we respond to such situations? Well, from Nehemiah we learn that the first key principle is found in verse 7, where Nehemiah says, I pondered them in my mind. I pondered them in my mind. Here, friends, Nehemiah demonstrates the age-old wisdom of thinking before one acts. How many of you are good at thinking first, then acting later? How many of you, well, some of you may have that gift, and if so, that's great. How many of you are good at actually doing something then thinking, I wish I hadn't said it like that or done that like that? Yes? 
I think it's so easy at times to have a knee-jerk reaction to a situation. Now, friends, what we see in Nehemiah is the model that we need to think first. But, friends, the reality of being human is we're not always going to get that right. And I know I'm, I'm very grateful for those who sometimes might get the sharp edge of me at times when I should have more grace and they show grace towards me. Friends, Nehemiah teaches us the principle of actually pondering them in our mind first and foremost to make sure that our action is based on our thinking and not just on our feelings. Yes, our feelings will drive us to address such, you know, themes of injustice and things that are not right, absolutely. But we will hopefully have clear thinking as to how we should respond. So Nehemiah demonstrates that. Yes, Nehemiah is still very angry at the situation, but his response comes out of his thinking. And that's the first key thing we've got to, uh, you know, since learn from Nehemiah. Because the result of this is that we see Nehemiah channeling his anger into positive, constructive action rather than going down the road of a destructive, intemperate action. Now, remember, because we're all wired differently, we will all express things differently. And that's a key thing. And to what might be measured for one person, another person could read as hostile. We've got to make sure we have grace with each other. But my prayer is that in all issues, whenever we're dealing with them, especially in church life, we would make sure that we actually approach every people and that we've thought through things. We've thought through what is the issue behind this? What is the real thing going on? We need to make sure we do that. So that's the first thing, pondering them in our minds. Think first, or as somebody used to say to me, count to 10 before you respond. If 10 isn't long enough, count to 20, or count to 50, or count to 100. Whatever works best for you, find that which works for you. And if it means you've got to remove yourself from a situation temporarily whilst you think about that, just say to the person, hey, I need to come back and talk about this. But for now, I just need to reflect. Friends, let us make sure we respect that in one another. Amen. So that's the first key principle we see in Nehemiah. The second key principle we see is that Nehemiah goes to those responsible for the wrong in private first. He goes to them in private. As we read in verse 7, Nehemiah said, I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. You can hear Nehemiah doing this. But what he's done, the second principle, is going to them in private. Friends, whenever we have any disagreements or issues, we need to make sure we raise that with one another in private. Because most times we will find we can actually sort things out. When others wrong us, and they will, friends, we will be either offended or hurt by people around us. But the question is, are we willing to go and sort that out? I know the differences of opinion or the times that I've upset people. When we've sat down, talked about it, and gone through it, we have a stronger relationship as a result of that. We have a better understanding of each other, and the church is so much stronger for it. Because that is how a family is called to act. The question is, will we seek to live that up? Will we seek, to, as I've said, going to a person to actually sort it out? As I say here in my notes, when others wrong us, and they will, we need to ensure we go to them with the right heart and the right mind in the right spirit to sort things out. Let's, I'll say that again. We need to ensure we go to them with the right heart and the right mind in the right spirit to sort things out. So, friends, that's the second principle, to go to them one-to-one -one or two-to-one to sort it out. The third key principle is that Nehemiah confirms the conversation and the outcome in public because this affected not just, you know, a couple of people. It was affecting so many people and such an issue because it was impacting so many different people. It needed to be actually brought into the open and the resolution made public, as Nehemiah says from verse 7b. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. 
They kept quiet because they could not because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the interest you are charging them. One percent of the money, grain, new wine and olive oil. Here, Nehemiah has been very direct with this level of detail, saying that in order to change the situation, in order to address it, these are the things that must be done. And friends, when there are issues that engulf either a large part of the life of a church or the, you know, or the whole church, it's important that these things are discussed and clear direction is given. We see that in uh, Nehemiah. Now, I hope that I don't have to come asking you for grain, new wine and olive oil, because that is not the circumstance we find ourselves. But whatever issues need responding to, we need to make sure that the outcome, when it impacts the community of faith, is dealt with in public for all to understand. So it puts hearts and minds to rest to make sure that we can move on beyond that. If we don't move on, it causes division. Furthermore, we're told that in this case, and this is a thought for us to practice here in the life of the church, I leave it to you, Nehemiah then ratifies the agreed outcome with the priest to ensure people keep to it. And we read that in verses 12 to 13. And then, you know, he summons the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they have promised. And so that is all done in the sight of God. Friends, these are all important, uh, you know, principles in how to deal with Issues. So three key principles there that Nehemiah, uh, you know, teaches us. And three key principles, I believe, we need to make sure that we observe as God's church today. Because whenever the church moves in a different direction or changes, the reality is that some people are going to struggle with that. And we need to make sure that when issues arrive in whatever uh, area uh, they do, that actually they can be addressed, that actually anything that makes people angry, that together you actually firstly step back and say, what is it that I'm angry about? And then seeking to deal with it one-to-one, -one, gathering together you know, one or, one or two people to say, actually, I'm struggling with this. How do we address it? And then if it's, as I've said, if it's an issue that impacts the whole church or a lot of the church, we bring it publicly. If it's an issue that only affects a small part, if it can be resolved and things put in place to help things go forward, we do that. We've got to make sure we do that for the sake of the church family. Because friends, how many of you like to live with division? How many of you like to live with enmity? How many of you like to live with destructive behavior? We don't. God calls us to live as one family. Now, of course, remember that family, we're called to live in unity. But unity does not mean uniformity. It does not mean that I'm trying to turn you into Tim Robb clones. You've got to think the way I think. You've got to walk the way I walk. You've got to talk the way I talk. No, definitely not, people are saying no, exactly. The fact is, we've got to make sure that we allow God to use us as, you know, uh, and actually he builds that sense of unity amongst us. Universe, uh, unity with diversity. Unity with diversity. And that is so important for the Christian family. And so we need to strive to make sure we achieve that. And whenever issues arise, can I encourage us to take on board these principles? Because if we don't, we will find actually challenges will arise and they could split the church. And sadly, the history of God's people, as well as the history of the church, is fraught with division after division. And we need to make sure we stay close to God, sharing with each other. So today, can I encourage you that when there's an issue that engages your feelings and arouses a sense of anger within you, recognize that that is not wrong. It's how you act on it that will determine whether or not you know, we act as the way God would have us. God has given us feelings to engage with the world and with each other, and that is so important. So that's, we've got to make sure we do that. And secondly, as I've said, when things do engage our feelings, we need to ensure that we take Nehemiah's advice here, 
to think things through and then to gather people together to make sure that we uh, deal with it in the right way. Friends, I'd love to say this morning that actually the church is going to be perfect from here on in. There's never going to be any issues, but that's not the case. But the question is, will we stay close to God? Will we stay close to each other? Because he wants to build his church. He wants to build his church here using each one of you. There is a a shaped place in the life of the church with your name on it. A name that cannot be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, played by anyone else. It is only you. God wants to use each of you in his church to actually reach this community and the world at large. So will this day, will we take on board the teaching of Nehemiah and the practice of Nehemiah? Will we seek to live for him and to follow him? Learning how to, uh, how to, you know, when we get angry, when we disagree, how to work together. Because God loves his people to be united together. Amen? Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for all that Nehemiah teaches us and challenges us. Lord, we know that it is a challenge at, the ti- at a time to live, you know, the way you want us to. But Lord, thank you that you came to serve and not to be served. Lord, we thank you that in that model of you, we know how to serve each other. Lord, help us, we pray, in the weeks ahead to let each other, in a sense, uh, to, to serve us and for us to serve them that together we would be your people, living under your gospel, proclaiming you to the world. Lord, show us how to live together in harmony, in unity, for the sake of your name and for the sake of your gospel. Lord, may our witness of being together, joined together, be such a great witness to the world this day and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Chocolate biscuits can indeed unite people so much, and we look forward to sharing those later on. Thank you, Jane. That's lovely. How many of you think chocolate brings people together? Yes? I think it does indeed. So thank you for that. If you can't eat chocolate, apologies. We'll find something else for you. But friends, we know that we do not live as God calls us to live, and that's why we now come to a time of confession. Because we all have a role to play in God's church not being the place that it's called to be. And yet God is gracious. He is all forgiving. He keeps forgiving. And friends, if God put a number on how many times we've uh, forgiven, I wouldn't be standing here today. I would have used up all my forgiveness tokens years ago. But God isn't like that. He forgives. He strengthens to carry on. So we bring our lives now before him in an attitude of confession. Please do respond in the words in yellow. In a dark and disfigured world, we have not held out the light of life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In a hungry and despairing world, we have failed to share our bread. Christ, have mercy. Have mercy. In a cold and loveless world, we have kept the love of God to ourselves. Lord, have mercy. May the Father forgive us all by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. And everyone said, Amen. And so we come round the table of our Lord, a table that brings people together, a table that unites people everywhere because it remembers what Jesus has done. And friends, if Jesus could have taken offence at his disciples, the fact that everyone deserted him, even his closest friends, the ones he had lived with for three years and celebrated life with, but he didn't. He sought to restore them, to encourage them, Friends, so too, this is what we must do with one another. And so as we gather round the table, we celebrate saying, The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts.
we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, Make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. See, a sign of unity that God calls us to. And so with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you the sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And so as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, the one body, because we all share in one bread. Just looking at those words again, though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Friends, this is a family that we're called to be part of. This is a family we're called to live in. What do we need to do differently today to live as Jesus' family today? It's a work in progress. It won't, he hasn't finished with us yet. He's always got work for us to do. So friends, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and now lives in you also. And feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving, and all God's people said, Amen. Friends, at this point, if you would like to receive a communion set, please do stand. If you require a gluten-free wafer, and I know there's at least one person here, can you please just raise your hand now, and I'll make sure that I bring it to you. So one, two, any on this side? No, I will make sure I bring that to you in a moment. Uh, we're now getting back to gluten-free wafers, so apologies if you haven't done that. But friends, do please stand now as communion sets are brought to you. And the music, uh, Suzanne is going to provide some lovely music. Thank you, Suzanne.
Are there any people still waiting for communion sets? Jesus said, I am the bread of life, taking the bread, the body of Christ, keep us all in eternal life. Amen. Jesus said, I am the true vine, the blood of Christ, keep us all in eternal life. Amen. Bread and wine that remind us, as we said, of all that Christ has done for us. What would we do to keep living for him as his people? One thing we can do is to join in the words of this post-communion prayer as we pray together saying, Holy and blessed God, you have fed us with the body and blood of your Son and filled us with your Holy Spirit. May we honour you not only with our lips but in lives dedicated to the service of God, Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please be seated, everyone? In a few moments' time, we will come to our closing hymn of praise. But first, we have Life 24 7, because of course, we know that, that to live as Christ's disciples in the world is about 24 7 living, not just about Sunday, uh, Sunday mornings or one evening during the week, it's about everything we do. Friends, one of the great news is that the Life News at St Mary's, the monthly sheet, is now back. This is the first time this has been produced since uh, the first lockdown. So please do take it away. Thank you to my new PA, Jane. Jane, you've done a great job. And I know it's a baptism by fire, and you'll see this develop over time. But do thank her for her wonderful work. And it's also available online. It was also sent out electronically. But do please take note of the various things that are happening. Because, friends, Lent begins this week. And on Wednesday, we have a communion service in the morning at nine o'clock for the beginning of Lent. And inside, you will find a list of various services and different things coming up, such as next Sunday night, we have a special evening service for, uh, that brings together people from our local deanery at six o'clock. Uh, in the Church of England, deanery is the language for a, for a group of churches within a much larger group of churches called the diocese. So do come to that next Sunday evening at six o'clock. The theme for that is actually Old Testament books. When they came to me and said, Tim, what Old Testament book could you supply a sermon on? Because they wanted me to preach. They wanted the minister of each church to preach. And I said, oh, I said, we're just doing a series on Nehemiah. So friends, come and be reminded of all that Nehemiah has to say. So that's next Sunday night. But also, as you'll read down, you'll read of different events, including an exciting new pilot of an evening event called St. Mary's at Six, coming up on Saturday, the 12th of March. Friends, we're used to worshipping on Sundays, yes? We may be used to small groups. But at the same time, we've got to think of people who engage at different times in different ways. And so this pattern of this pilot of four uh, evening things that include worship, food and fellowship, uh, isn't that right, guys? You can just smile where you are. Excellent. It promises to be something different, but we're looking at different times. So the first month is going to be on Saturday. The second month is going to be on a Sunday. And this complements existing Sunday night events that we've held in the past that we hope are going to be uh, you know, running again in the near future. It's about enriching and having a great pattern. So do put that in your diary. Something different, a Saturday night. You might be thinking, not sure about this. You won't know about it unless you come and try it, guys. And there is food as part of it, so you do get fed, so that's always got to be a good sign. Friends, coming up, we also have our annual meeting, and yes, church, uh, churches have to have an annual meeting. 
The annual report was uh, uh, released two weeks ago. Please do take that. It's in the red box on the table by the door. But you've now also got the, uh, the other book that has all the financial pages in it, that has the agenda, that has the last meeting minutes from last year in this. So we always have two different booklets. Please do pick up a copy of this. And that's also in the red box. You'll discover that this is at one end of the box and this is at the other end of the box. So do please make sure you pick those up. And if you've got any questions that you would like raised at the annual meeting, please let us know either before the meeting or there's an opportunity, especially in the first part, for us to consider them. We really commend that to you, so that will be really good. Before we get to that, though, this Tuesday, uh, especially in response to the Ukraine situation, the Archbishop of York, is that right, Barbara, has called the nation to pray. And so we're going to be holding a prayer meeting in the church hall on Tuesday night, 6 to 8. I'll try and send out a reminder by church suite. You may get start, those on email, life news, may start getting a few notices coming through this week about different things. Please don't ignore them. Please do read them. But that's Tuesday night, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Friends, we're called to pray for the situation in Ukraine and that the evil that we're seeing will be stopped in its tracks and that it won't spread. So we do ask you to join us for that. That promises to be, you know, a special occasion. Coming up next Saturday, Sarah, can we have the slide up, thanks? There is a men's breakfast, 5th of March, 8.30. Uh, men, this is for you. Uh, topics, zombies, monsters, and the gospel. Something very different. Guys, will you come to that? Because it does promise to be good. Uh, is he worth hearing, Ray? Is he worth hearing because he's somebody you know? There you are. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Great. Right, so this person is somebody who looks like an Old Testament prophet and who in his spare time seems to write novels about zombies and different things. But he's also a Christian first and foremost. So men, come and hear him and be part of that here at church. But please do see Gavin today if you're planning to come because we do need to know for catering purposes. And remember, men, we get to cook breakfast. We get to cook breakfast. So do enjoy that. We, do, we are looking forward to that. And thank you to Gavin and Ray for all your help with the men's ministries. Today, after the service, we have some refreshments left from last night's concert there. The refreshments, uh, in terms of the cakes, were provided by the youth. They're raising funds for New Day, the Christian conference uh, uh, that they go to in the summer. Friends, if you'd like some cake, please do make a donation for them. If you don't have any money, they will accept an IOU because I think we know where most of you live, so that's all right. But please do take the opportunity to engage with them. We're very grateful for all the youth and the way they complement different things. We're hoping to have, sorry, one notice I forgot about the APCM, the annual meeting. We are hoping to have a lunch afterwards, uh, which we're hoping to have a clipboard to sign up next week and everything for those that would like to stay on after the meeting for a lunch. Uh, do put that away in your memory banks for now because we'd love you to join. So uh, that would be a really lovely time. And also, if you're involved in service leadership in any way, uh, assistant warden, sides people, Bible reading, etc., etc., communion, there's a new version of the service duties booklet that is now available from David and from Edward. We do commend that to you. It's over on the side. If you would like to explore what it means to join the church PCC, there's a leaflet on the side too. We do commend that to you. It is now my great privilege this morning to publish the Bands of Marriage between Richard Peter Moore and Louise Allen Holloway, both of this parish. This is for the first time of asking for Richard and Louise. If any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. Are you sure? 
That's always a good sign. That's a good sign, uh, Richard and Louise. If you're joining us online, you've got through one uh, opportunity of the calling of Ben so far. Let's pray. Loving God, we do thank you for the gift of relationships. We thank you for all we've heard this morning. Lord, we thank you for the gift of marriage. And we pray for Richard and Louise as they prepare for that special day. Lord, we pray, unite them in their love. Increase their love for each other. And Lord, reveal your love to them, we pray, that they would grow to experience your amazing, perfect, everlasting, unconditional love all the days of their lives. In your name we pray. Amen. I can rest now. No, not quite. Um, do this one more notice, and Julie is going to bring us. Julie, if you'd like to go to this lectern here, thanks. And if we can shift, because this relates to the Ukraine situation. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Well, I don't have to obviously explain why I'm standing here in relation to the Ukraine situation, but I'm asking you please to pray particularly for one of my students who's studying the, the master's programme I lead. He is a pastor in Kiev, and I can't name him because I'm wanting to protect him for obvious reasons, but please could you pray for him because obviously we can't connect with him at the moment. Um, Hopefully he'll be able to in some time, but obviously it's very, very uncertain there. Very worrying for him and his family and the church he pastors. So please, if I could ask you when you pray for, uh, for Kiev, for Ukraine, to remember the pastor that I am very concerned for. So thank you very much. When people are involved or when people are caught up in situations that we know, it does you know, dig deep into our hearts and, you know, and minds. And so we think of this pastor. But we also think, as we heard in the prayers that were offered today, that 70% of Ukrainians regard themselves as Christian. 70%. That is a huge percentage. What will we do this week to pray for them? Let's just pause for a moment. Loving God, we've already prayed for the situation in Ukraine, but we bring to you this particular situation and any other links that we may have personally that we know of people caught up in this conflict in Ukraine. You know, thank you that nothing escapes your attention, O oh God. Lord, show us how we can lift all these matters up to you in prayer, knowing that you are a God of action that you are God who brings your comfort, your strength into all situations. Lord, give us the patience, the stamina to keep praying for this, to see things righted in your time. And so, Lord, we do pray for this pastor, Lord, and all the other ones around him, members of his church and everyone. Lord, give him all the strength he needs, we pray, to keep being your faithful witness despite the face of persecution from an invasion. In your name we pray. Amen. And so we come now to our closing hymn of praise, a hymn of praise that reminds us that it is to God whom we give the glory, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Even in the midst of great challenges, we worship God and acknowledge his eternal love for us. Would you please stand, everyone?
so as we remain as we are our final prayer may the love of the lord jesus draw you to himself may the power of the lord jesus strengthen you in his service may the joy of the lord jesus fill your hearts and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be among you and remain with you always amen and we say to one another the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all evermore amen friends thank you for joining us thank you for joining us online god bless and have a great day